So I'm actually talk, intending to talk about two things. One is how our church went virtual, which maybe is less interesting to you guys because maybe all your churches have already done this already. And if so, just kind of give me a signal like, yeah, 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 that's not, I don't care about that part. And then I'll go on to how General Assembly went virtual, which is the part that I know that you don't know. Um, so, but they do tie together. So our, the church that Jordan and I go to is the Champlain Valley UU Society at cvus.org. And because I've been live streaming video from GA for years, it made sense when COVID came along for me to, per, me to be the person to spiel um, having our services go online. So we tried a couple of other systems. I mean, at the beginning, we, the presenters gathered in the sanctuary and we streamed from there. But then at the point that everybody had to stay home, we did the whole thing from home using um, Zoom and YouTube. When we broadcast from the sanctuary, we used a thing called Open Broadcaster Studio, which is free. It's a freeware video casting program and it's actually what we use at GA when we're broadcasting. Um, it's a streaming, it's a free streaming package and you can stream, you can, it's like a tiny little TV studio. You can intermix uh, videos and images and sound. But once we decided that we all wanted to be on Zoom, then we just used Zoom for everybody to be on. And um, we also, stream to YouTube because not everybody can figure Zoom out. So the plan that we made is we decided everybody would be on Zoom, um, everybody would be muted except for the presenters. And this is a regular Zoom account. This is not the expensive uh, webinar account. Um, we couldn't think of a way, but we don't have musicians that could perform live because we have two pianists and one lives up in the hills with terrible internet. And the other, well, I think she finally did manage to get her piano tuned, but at the beginning of COVID, her piano was out of tune and she couldn't get a piano tuner to come. So, um, so we've been recording all of the music. Um, and so we do a service um, using Zoom and at the end, we unmute everybody and there's a coffee hour. I'll talk about how that works. So our process is that Monday, at the beginning of the week, we have an organizational meeting and it's the, whoever are gonna be presenting, so the minister, the worship associate, we always have somebody from the worship committee who's kind of the additional person, anybody else who's gonna be speaking. And we also have a gatherer, who is the person who gathers the, all the material that's gonna be um, part of the service. And they, so they're there. And then also the person who's gonna be actually video casting, do, doing the Zoom meeting and, and making the meeting work, who we call either video caster or tech host. Don't know which is the best term. So that group gets together. So for example, this Sunday, the presenters are gonna be our son, Zach, Jessica's godson, and his business partner, uh, Jackson, and the two of them are magicians and they're gonna be talking about reality and magic. And anyway, it's gonna be interesting. So organizational meeting was Zach and Jackson, me is the video caster. Jordan is going to be the worship associate. And um, the person who's going to be helping to gather all the material on, all week. And we make a spreadsheet of all the elements. There's always pre-service music. Then there's a prelude. Then, you know, there's welcome, chalice lighting. There's like a row on our spreadsheet for each thing. And some of the things are pre-recorded. And some of them are going to be live on Zoom. And we just go back and forth between those two things. So over the course of the week, the gatherer nags people to get in anything that's going to be pre-recorded, and nags people to make sure the people who are going to be speaking live have figured out what they're going to be doing. Um, and we usually do a rehearsal on Saturday afternoon. Not, if it's the same old people and they've done it before, then we don't do that. But if there's anybody that hasn't done it before, it's kind of like in theater what you would call a cue to cue where you don't actually go through each thing, you don't play all the videos, but you just do the transition. So it's clear, like when the prelude music is over to make sure that the person who's gonna be um, doing the welcome knows when they should start talking. 
And then when the introduction to the offering is done to make sure the person who's playing the video of the offering music knows when to start it. So it's really just making sure that we know how all those transitions are gonna work. And then we start the Zoom meeting. The video caster starts the Zoom meeting a half an hour before. And we ask everybody who's gonna be presenting to get on a half an hour before, partly so that we can make sure that if anybody is a no-show, we can figure out what the heck is going on with them. And we can make any last minute uh, adjustments. And um, we have a waiting room in Zoom, just so that we can kind of deliberately let people in. It's a way of present, preventing Zoom bombers from coming in and posting crap, which has happened. Um, so once the meeting is started, the videocaster, which is usually me, plays whatever videos are gonna be shown, just like this, just sharing the screen. They have to make sure to enable the sound. And I have two monitors, so right now you're seeing a slide, I hope, with no borders around it. It's just taken up the whole thing, which looks really nice. Um, if, but you have to kind of have to have a second screen for that to be easy to do. Um, and otherwise, you can share just a window, but then you get the whole border around it. It doesn't look as nice. So it really helps for people to have a second screen. So that's, that's how we do our services. And at the end, um, we go into coffee hour and Jordan takes over. We really need to find, I've trained up another person who can do the video casting, but we still haven't found somebody to train up to do what Jordan does, which is really just putting people into breakout rooms the same way that we've been doing our social hours here. Because we'll have 40 people maybe, too many people have one single conversation. So we break people up into separate rooms of like six or seven people so that they can have a conversation. And Jordan does that. So that is how we do our congregation. Does anybody, is that all? Who cares? Yeah, we're already doing that. How do you, how do you decide who gets put into what um, chat room? Oh, that's a good question. That's really a question for Jordan. And I think he's tried a couple of different ways. I think he's making a tart out of the large number of raspberries we have. Oh, there he is. Um, you know, and that actually, it's interesting because the um, chat host is a much less technical job and really a much more social job. And so that's why it's been a little bit interesting trying to find somebody to step into that role. Because you have to be comfortable enough with the tech to run the breakout rooms and stuff in, in, um, in Zoom, but it's really about like looking at who's there and very much on the fly, just knowing the people and putting the rooms together. So it's sort of a social, sort of an intuitive process. So you guys aren't using the sort of Zoom magical randomly distribute people? Uh, no, we haven't done that. Um, I don't know why, just, you know, we could, but we haven't. I think, I think we do that, but then we have usually about 100 people. Um, yeah, there were times at GA when people were, uh, I don't know whether they were trying to do it deliberately, but at least I was definitely in one session where I think it was about 100 people and they did them by hand and like, it took five minutes and we all just sort of talked among ourselves in yeah. a slightly chaotic way in the main room while the host was busy going click, 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 and putting everybody in rooms. It no, I, I think we do it randomly, which is actually pretty nice because then you get to meet people that you haven't. Well, and sometimes that's exactly, you know, that is also part of my criteria and I'm trying not to put just the same yeah. old people together. Yeah. Um, and then every once in a while, there's the, please don't put me in a room with so-and-so and so, -and -so, and so <laughs> you gotta be, keep track of that too. Um, All right, well, let's move on and talk about GA then. So, um, normally we start planning GA, well, the GA office starts planning GA for four years in advance. So I don't know, but I'm in IT and we start planning GA in about January because we need to make sure that we've got, uh, that we're ready to recruit a bunch of volunteers to help us do what we do. And normally we just live stream everything that happens in the big hall, all the big events. And then uh, lately we've been streaming all the events from two workshop rooms. And that's because uh, convention centers uh, charge obscene amounts of money for pretty much everything. 
but literally a thousand dollars a day for an internet connection from a conference you know, conference room in a convention center that is equivalent to what we probably all pay fifty dollars a month for from our home but you have no option you know it's a monopoly so so anyway that's what we've been doing in the past and we know how to do that we staff up we have like 13 volunteers we're good to go uh, but this year as COVID happened we just kind of had this bad feeling that that was probably not going to be the way it was going to happen but um and we kept waiting for the ga office to announce that we were going virtual and it was the end of march it was the beginning of april and we still they, they weren't announcing they weren't announcing it turned out that the delay was that the um, head of the ga office who was new this year can you imagine this being your first GA, um, was doing a masterful job of not just bleeding money as we canceled, because we had to cancel contracts with the convention center, hotels, caterers, a God, I don't even know how many suppliers. And apparently she did a really great job of, of um, backing out of those contracts or delaying them until we could come back. But she knew that once we announced we were going virtual, she would lose the negotiating position so anyway so there was that balance anyway by i was trying to figure out the exact date but i know that it was april 15th when it proposed a plan to the ga office and okay let's do it this way and i'll tell you how it works um so that did not give us a whole lot of time to make everything happen um and at that point a bunch of people maybe a thousand some people had already registered so they were offered refunds, um, either entire refunds or refunds of the difference, because it was $400 when it was going to be an in-person conference and $150 for the virtual GA. And so, um, so people were giving their money back. And interestingly, by the time we were, by the time GA started, we had um, a pretty terrific turnout and a tons of, it took a while. The, the normal shape of registrations for GA, I think there's a big lump at the beginning where people want to sign up for hotels as soon as hotels are available and people register pretty early because they've got to take vacation from their work and travel plans and stuff. But for a virtual conference, you can decide that morning. So it's a really different shape of the, of the registration. So that was interesting. Um, so two people from IT really took the lead on making GA happen from a technical point of view, a guy named Larry and me. And Larry created a, a, the participants portal, which is a w little homebrew website that in order to participate in GA, you would log into that site and that's where everything was. Now, one thing that came up is that if we're doing GA virtually, it doesn't really have to be Wednesday to Sunday. It doesn't, you know, we could totally change it up and have it be a completely different schedule. So there was a talk for a while, like, well, maybe we should do like four weekends in a row or start having the workshops every Tuesday and Wednesday for the month of June or whatever. And interestingly, it didn't, it didn't turn out to be that different from a regular GA, uh, partly because GA is normally surrounded by a bunch of kind of ancillary events. So if we changed our schedule, it was going to screw everybody else up. The Minister's Association always meets the two days before. The Church Administrator's Association always meets, I forget when. And so we ended up with a schedule that was pretty similar to the regular schedule. We, we decided to start a little earlier on Tuesday, and we realized there was no reason not to go all the way through Sunday since nobody had to travel home but it was pretty much the same kind of schedule as a regular GA. Um, and normally we have a big events that happen in the big hall and then workshops that happen in the little hall. And this was pretty much the same deal. Since there was no big hall, we just called those prime time events versus workshops. And then we also created a third kind of event to try to replace or simulate this, the sitting down next to a stranger and starting to chat with them or chatting with the person who's sitting next to you in the workshop room. So we created um, reflection times, which actually don't show on the slide because they're down off the bottom. But the, in the evening, 
there was a reflection period. And that was simply like an enormous coffee hour where we put a lot of people together. And I'll talk about that. So that was, that was the plan. So Larry and his programmer, that's programmer singular, only one programmer named Paul, uh, put together, this is what the uh, participation portal looked like. There's a menu down the side and these are all the different things that you could do. So there was, if you look part of the way down, there's the main hall. That's where all the prime time events happened. They had kind of a virtual exhibit hall. Um, and then there were, which doesn't show here, actually there were workshops. And so everybody would go to this same website and here where you see the big program book general assembly picture when they were events happening, instead you would see the video of that event and you would see a chat box where people were chatting about the event if it was a prime time event. So, um, so the prime time events, we literally had three to 4,000 people at these events, which was kind of crazy. Actually, the Sunday service, we had 12,000 people. But, and, and a lot of those people were probably, in, you know, multiple people. Um, so primetime events are a couple of different kinds. You have the worships, there's a worship every morning, big celebration. At the beginning, there's always welcoming celebration with a banner parade, which obviously there was no banner parade. Um, and the biggest one of those is the Sunday service. But there's also the service of the living tradition, which is the celebration of ministerial transitions of various types. Synergy bridging, is a which is a celebration of youth transitioning to young adult. Um, so those were all, well, the, the, those weren't all any one thing. They were, some of them were pre-recorded and some of them were a mixture of pre-recorded and live. Most of them were pre-recorded, like the Sunday service was entirely pre-recorded. Um, we could have just posted that and had people watch it any old time. But we kind of wanted people to all to be watching at the same time. So we streamed it at 10 and we streamed it again at 1. And then we posted it so that you could watch it any time. And if you go to uua.org slash GA, you can watch it now. And it's fantastic. Um, that really pissed off people in the Midwest because... 10 o'clock is a pretty normal time for the East Coast to have a church service. And one in the afternoon, 10 o'clock Pacific time is a pretty normal time for a church service on the West Coast. But it really kind of screwed folks in Central and Mountain time. And so I think if we did it again, we probably would do that a different way. Um, I think some of them moved their times and some of them figured well, we'll just watch it next week. Um, so that's the way we did the worships. And with the music, it was all pre recorded. Um, where there was a mixture of live and pre recorded, it actually was pretty clever. It was Zoom, which was then streamed. Because when you're in a Zoom meeting, you can stream. We could be streaming this meeting right now to YouTube if we wanted to. And so they would have the participants in Zoom and then streaming out. Um, and that's the way they did the general sessions, which are the business sessions, which are, I mean, pandemonium, because you've got all these different board members and different speakers and reports. And then in the midst, you have debate. So you need to have a way for people to speak at a mic. And then you have votes. And luckily, we would already, for, for five or six years, been enabling offsite delegates to participate in debates. and to vote. So we already had set up and we use the same tools we've used before, um, a mechanism where you could essentially be standing in the queue at the pro mic or the con mic or the procedural mic, just as if you were in the big hall standing in line at the pro mic, the con mic or the procedural mic. And we had a voting system where you'd open voting and then everybody could vote whatever they were going to vote and close voting. And we've been doing that for years anyway. And when you first logged in, you had to enter your delegate credentials if you were a delegate. And only delegates would see that voting option. And only delegates would see the option to stand in and line at a queue to speak. 
Um, it, it's been too hard to actually patch people in to turn to unmute them because this is not a Zoom meeting that we have 3,000 people in the Zoom meeting. Most everybody is watching on the stream. So we came up with two ways for people to be able to speak at the mics. One is they could submit a written statement beforehand, which somebody would read. The second is they could actually submit a video beforehand, which would get shown. And the third is that they could type into the chat. Um, so it's, you know, it was a little more stilted, I think, than the usual rough and tumble general session debates and votes. But those are generally pretty chaotic anyway. So it, it seemed to work okay. We knew that that was going to be complicated enough that I thought, man, I, I do not want to take on the gluing together of the having various board members and the two co-moderators and the other people speaking and people reading and speaking, uh, reading people's statements and everything. So we, um, we hired the same company that's been handling the AV in the big hall for years, partly because we realized, well, they must be screwed because all of their big events are shut down. Um, and we figured that they probably would be adopting to um, you know, adopt, adapting to, to online conferences anyway. So we had them handle the general sessions, thank God, because it's, even with them doing it, it was pretty, it was pretty stressful. The first night, the Wednesday night, there's always, you know, the banner parade, welcome and celebration, whatever it is. And there's always general session one, which is really short, but it's just uh, opening the thing, adopting the rules. It's kind of just procedural necessary stuff but there is a vote and there were so many more people than we expected and we hadn't really been able to load test the system that everybody all the delegates jumped into the portal and they're all opening up and the thing just it didn't completely crash but the voting and the microphone speaking part was just dead in the water but luckily larry the guy that that um handled the system had anticipated that we might need to size up and so we were on uh, Amazon cloud and he figured he could do that what he didn't realize is that when you size up you need to reboot the server so um so he said okay folks technical glitch here's what we have to do we're going to take a 15 minute intermission and we'll be right back and so they did that and 15 minutes later I'm sure it took them less than 15 minutes but they wanted to give themselves a little time then everything was ready to go and they could take the vote. And they, there was a musician that, that played and led singing during any time there was a gap like that. So that was probably the biggest glitch. And it wasn't that bad, you know, and everybody knows that we're just making this all up. We're, you know, we're doing our best. This is new, shoestring, et cetera. And so people were super patient, which was great. Um, the third kind of event, which doesn't, normal it's not a part of normal ga is featured speakers normally we have one featured speaker which is the whale lecturer and we get somebody terrific and famous to be the lecturer and this year was naomi klein who's a canadian uh, climate activist and she was wonderful but in addition to her um i think in order to make ga more attractive and add a feature that we could do virtually is we actually had six other featured speakers, and I should be able to tell you who they are. Uh, if I could remember who they were. Uh, Howard Bryant. Anyway, a uh, bunch of terrific people. So, and you can still go and, um, and watch them now because um, some of them were completely pre-recorded. Some of them, they recorded their talk but then we're available for Q&A at the end. But we recorded everything. So everything was, everything that happened during all of GA was recorded and is still available online um, to watch now and through at least the end of the summer, probably through the end of the year. So during these prime time events, we had, we had this for years. We had a chat box and people could chat, which is great, but we thought, um, 4,000, 3,000, 4,000 people typing into one chat box. The stuff is going to fly by so fast, you're not even going to be able to read it. 
So we decided to break um, up the chat into five rooms. And uh, Latanya, the head of the GA office said, we're gonna go with completely uncontroversial room names. None of this famous you use or anything. So we named them for trees. And when you went into the, the, these primetime events, you'd see the video and next to it, you'd see the chat box. And you were just assigned at random to one of the rooms. Although you could change around. And people started changing around and the rooms started developing their own uh, character. At one point, the, a group of folks in the Maple Room, I guess the youth started congregating in the Maple Room and de uh, declared it to be the Maple Youth Autonomous Zone. So that was kind of cool that, that people were really engaging in the chat. Um, so this is, let me talk about volunteers. So in the past, I've had like 13 volunteers. Jessica, you were a volunteer more than once. Yeah. Yeah. It was and, awesome. Uh, it was in Nashville. Yeah, there we go. So this time I realized, okay, I need a lot more volunteers. I need a boatload of volunteers, actually. So I had a bunch of teams. And in this case, this was the primetime chat host team. Uh, and the team lead was none other than our own Sarah Russell, because I knew that she would be amazing. And Deb Weiner from All Star One, of course, has done this before, so I had her. And we had about 10 or 12 people. We deci I decided we probably don't need five people on at a time because you could probably monitor two rooms at a time. So we, need, we decided we needed at least three chat hosts on at any one time. But they had a back room, you know, back channel chat so they could check in with each other. And they had two missions. One is to just answer questions. So if people said, wait a minute, what, you know, what amendment are we uh, um, discussing now? Or where's the order of service for this? Then they would have the information and, and answer. But the other is occasionally people start getting obstreperous and you want someone to just be able to intervene and say, wait a minute, um, don't say that. That's, that's abusive or that's inappropriate or whatever. We were worried that there was gonna be a lot of that and there actually was surprisingly little. Um, there, because there have been a number of people who have been unhappy with the UUA's approach to anti-racist, anti-racism work, feeling that we've been too, uh, kind of too bold and putting it too much front and center, and that um, I won't say they're exactly all lives matter folks, but they're definitely why can't we all just get along, folks? And uh, and they've been extremely critical of the UUA, and it kind of came to a head at last year's GA when the minister of the Spokane congregation, the host congregation for GA, um, started, I forget if selling or giving away, a little book that he wrote that was a set of three essays that were really critical, saying we're just being divisive, we're just making things worse, we're just putting a spotlight on racism is just, um, you know, making things worse and we're just being social justice warriors and we're just intersectionality is bunk and you name it. Anyway, it was, it got a little ugly and over the course of the year, there are people who are still pretty pissed off about it. Um, if you want to know more, just Google Gadfly Papers, which is the name of this whole book and you'll find out more than you ever want to know. So it wasn't clear to us whether they might kind of come in and storm the bastions. Um, but interestingly, they did not. So. Um, there were moments in the chat where people were upset with each other. There were moments in the chat where people were upset with the moderators or other speakers. But it was all, it, it all fell within the bounds, as far as I know, um, of kind of discourse that, that was working. Um, so anyway, that's how the primetime events worked and the first team of volunteers. Jump in if anybody has questions. So the next thing um, was workshops. And this is what I primarily worked on. Because I realized, huh, workshop is really pretty much like a church service, right? You've got a couple of presenters. They may have stuff that's video, they may not. Um, and then you probably want to have some kind of discussion at the end. So I figured that I could use more or less the same kind of technology that we've been using for church. So um, we set up, we actually set up 14 Zoom accounts, each could have up to a thousand people. 
which was good. Originally, we were going to have them only have 500 people, and we actually had workshops with almost 700 people. So it was good that we that we went for the thousand person uh, license. And similarly to the way that we've been staffing our churches um, services, I figured that we needed, along with the presenters, to support them. I needed to provide two volunteers for each workshop. One's the tech host to start the Zoom meeting, to record it, um, and to do things that only a host can do, like only a host can do breakout rooms, um, and only a host can do polls. So that was a tech host. And then also I wanted there to be a chat host who would be, rather than concentrating on the technology, they'd be concentrating on the people. So they would be watching the chat and answering technical questions in the chat. They'd also be watching all these little thumbnails to make sure that we didn't have Zoom bombers coming in and taking their pants down or posting Confederate flags or whatever it is that Zoom bombers do. Um, and so, and the chat hosts also, well, both of them were really doing whatever the presenters asked them to do, whatever it would take to make the presentation, the workshop work. So um, some workshop presenters said, I got this. I do Zoom all the time. This is like, just stand aside. I'm on it, uh, which is great. But many of and some were kind of freaked out by the whole idea of doing stuff on Zoom. They'd never done it. And so it was fantastic to have two volunteers with them saying, we got this. We'll, if you have a video or slides or whatever, we can show them it can be just like you were standing in a room and you can just say next slide, please, or can I have the next video or whatever. Um, they also offered to, if there's gonna be Q&A at the end or whenever, it can be hard to present and watch the chat at the same time. Like right now, I'm totally ignoring the chat. So if anybody puts anything in the chat, then I've missed it. Um, so they offered to be the people that monitor um, the chat and they could collect all the questions to answer them at the end, uh, whatever, however the presenters wanted them to do it. Um, and the other thing is a fair number, I think about a quarter, a third maybe, of workshops plan to have breakout rooms where they plan to have, we'll do a presentation, then we'll break up into small groups and do a thing, we'll get back together, do more, maybe small groups again. And so, um, so the tech host would be the one to be organizing that. And in some, I know there was one workshop that, that said, yeah, so we want people to be in pairs. So, you know, break out rooms of just two people. But we said, well, the problem is that there's a limit of 50 breakout rooms and we could have a thousand people. So we can't promise you that you're gonna have just two people per breakout room. It's not gonna be the way it works. We're just gonna to have to see how many people uh, show up and do what we can do. And we actually found out to our surprise that with the thousand user license, if you have more than 500 people in the Zoom meeting, you can't do breakout rooms at all. So that was an exciting moment when we found that out. Um, but it generally, it worked pretty well. I mean, the breakout rooms might've had more people than the presenters were hoping. Um, but the um, tech host would, as um, Herb was pointing out earlier, with such large numbers, you just have to have people automatically assigned to a room. And then, you know, you give them 10 minutes to do whatever the exercise is, and then you bring everybody back into the room. So, um, so that worked out pretty well. And in addition to the live, these workshops that I'm describing, there were also, I think, maybe 21 workshops that were entirely pre-recorded. So they were just up on the website and people can watch them anytime. They still can actually. So I had, there were five workshop time slots and the GA office asked us how many workshops could we do at the same time? And they were kind of hoping for 16 or 20. And we're like, no, 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 no. I don't think we can come up with that. Yet. Ah. So we said, okay, how about 10? We do 10 at a time. Cause I knew I was going to be, 10 tech hosts, 10 chat hosts, sorry, that's a typo, it should be 10 each, uh, 20 volunteers, 10 of each, working in, at the same time. So Thursday morning at 10 a.m., I needed to have 20 volunteers on. And I knew that I couldn't have, you can't expect everybody to make every time slot. 
So I need to have some extra volunteers. So I actually had more or less 14 of each um, and then let them schedule themselves. So out of five time slots, most of these folks worked four of the time slots. And they worked so much more than they were supposed to work um, because they get in free. Anytime you're a volunteer, you get in free. And we figured, well, if you're getting in free to something that otherwise is going to cost 150 bucks, we can't really ask you to work more than about 10 hours. Well, so I interviewed each person. I don't think they knew I was interviewing them, but you know, I had kind of a pre, let me just explain what the job is because I, I needed these people to be able to do the thing. If they couldn't do the thing, there was going to be no workshop. I mean, if they didn't show up or they got screwed stuff up, then it, it would screw up the whole workshop. These guys had to be good. Um, and in some cases I said, you know, actually it sounds to me like a much better job for you would be this other job over here. Um, and so we ended up with that awesome, just an awesome set of volunteers. Um, so I had a set of about 14 tech hosts and a set of about 14 chat hosts. So that's, now we're already up to what, about 45 people that I'm managing, 40 people. Um, and Jordan was the head of the chat hosts. So then the next kind of event we had, oh, actually before we, yeah, the next kind of event we had were networking events. And this is to Jessica's point that part of the point of going to something like GA is you want to meet with people. So we decided, well, let's just have Zoom meetings where all we do is you just get there and we divide you into, into breakout rooms. And um, so we plan to have three networking events, one each evening and then a coffee hour after each of the two Sunday services. But then they added after general session two, I don't know what they were talking about, but whatever they were talking about, they decided to have a networking event right after that where people would discuss whatever that topic was. You'd think I would know, but I, I never get to attend GA at all because I'm so busy doing all this stuff. So that was our first thing where, okay, great. This is great. We got the tech house. They know how to break people into rooms and uh, if we have more than a thousand people, then we'll just open up a second Zoom room because we do have 14 of them, so no problem. So about 900 people showed up. Great, open the breakout rooms. We open the breakout rooms and they shut down. We're like what? Open the breakout rooms and they shut down. So that was the point at which we figured out, we went back, we're reading the documentation and the Zoom specs are confusingly written. So when we looked back, we thought, oh, okay, that's what they meant. If you have a thousand person license and you're limited to 50 breakout rooms, then it won't work if you have more than 500 people. So anyway, so at that point we thought, all right, well, uh, fire up another room and just tell people to go there. So we told people, all right, here's the link. Just everybody leave and go to that link until we get below 500 people. And we did that and then the breakout rooms worked in both, both events and it worked okay. But surprisingly, so these are people who have been told, get into small groups, talk about this thing, whatever it was, take notes and email the notes to an email address. So we have everybody in these breakout rooms and they kept popping out to the main room saying, what are we supposed to do? No, no, no one told us what to do. We don't know what to talk about which I thought, wait a minute, when's the last time you use waited to be told what to do? I mean, wow, that was new. And, um, and I think it's a little tough when you're put into a breakout room with a bunch of people you don't know. There was, there was kind of a lack of leadership. And again, I'm thinking, wow, this is you use? I would think that someone would just seize the day, but, um, but they didn't. So that was, it worked out okay. I don't know how much how many notes were sent in. I don't know how well that worked from the point of view of discussing that topic, but it confirmed something that I suspected, which is for the reflections where people are really just going to be getting together to chat, just putting a bunch of people in a room is not enough. It's too, it's too awkward if you don't know people at all. So some volunteers and I just got together and made a plan and we decided, all right, we're going to do two things. One is we're gonna just make up some questions. So I just made shit up. And I, I just made up for each of, the, each of the networking events, 
happened after one of the big events. One of them was after the service of the living tradition. One of them was after the Ware lecture. One of them was after the um, synergy bridging event. So I just made up, I forget, four questions, maybe three questions about each one of them. You know, what's the role of ministry in your congregation? What did your congregation do for, you know, to, for that bridging process for kids? Just, you know, pretty obvious questions. And in each case, also, the first question is, or instruction was, introduce yourself. So we um, asked a minister, Sunshine Wolf, to make a little video that explained what to do. So for these networking events, as everybody joined the meeting, we had Sunshine's video saying, okay, here's what's going to happen. You're going to get put in a networking room. You're going to get put in a breakout room. And here's what you should do. You should all introduce yourselves. And there were specific instructions about that. And then talk about these questions. Except if you feel like talking about something else, go ahead. But this just gives you, you know, something to talk about if you're not sure what else. And so we do that, did that and it worked way better. And then, but it was, still wasn't perfect. So after the first networking event, we had another little caucus. People tended to drift in. They didn't all show up at the same time. So they didn't all see that video that we made. And it was awkward to show it over and over. So instead we made a slide that had those instructions. And as people came into the event, we had the tech host who was handling this stuff. Then we had a bunch of chat hosts, like five or six or more even, seven or eight. And as soon as there were five or six people that showed up, the tech host would put them into a breakout room with a chat host. And the chat host would say, okay, guys, this is great. Here you are, this is what's gonna happen. I want you to all introduce yourselves. And then, you know, you could talk about these questions if you want to, and they, they'd post a link to where we had the questions. And the chat hosts would stay long enough to make sure that people were talking, and then they would slink away, come back to the main room so they could get assigned to the next room. So they would just go and kind of start one room after another. And that, just breaking the ice and get, getting people started seemed to make a huge difference. And um, then we started hearing reports and people were really enjoying themselves. And, and um, in some cases, people afterwards said, wait a minute, can I get the contact information of those people? And we're like, we have no idea who they were. You're going to do that. You need to do that while you're still in the room. Um, but that worked, that worked pretty well. And so that was the best we could do in terms of giving people something like the opportunity to just chat with people that they didn't know. Um, the other thing that those chat hosts were doing were just circulating from room to room once the rooms were going to just make sure of two things. One is it wasn't just awkward silence that people were conversing. And also just to make sure that nobody was doing anything inappropriate or haranguing people. And actually there was, there was one guy that would show up in a room, bring up the whole gadfly controversy. And then I noticed if I went to the same room that he was in, he would immediately leave. So, um, so just sort of being, having somebody show up just to point out we have, a, we have an agreement. Everybody clicked an agreement when they joined the GA portal to say we're going to be respectful um, was helpful. And, and I think this guy knew that he was uh, planning on breaking that agreement. And if we were there, it was going to spoil his fun. But we didn't have anybody take their pants down. We, I don't, as far as I know, we didn't have any Zoom bombing at all. I heard a report that at the end of one of the workshops, a woman lay down in her bed and took her shirt off. But it sounded like she probably had forgotten that her video was on. I mean, it didn't seem like a flashing the camera kind of thing. Anyway, it wasn't part of the recording because when we recorded these, it, we did include um, the thumbnails of the participants, just the presenters. So, I mean, that was as bad as got, which is pretty, pretty fantastic. Um, so we recorded everything, things that were pre-recorded, great, um, but things that were lively recorded, and we captioned and transcribed everything. And this is the first time at GA we've been able to do that. I mean, and this is another thing that I feel like we probably can't go back now um, because we made this work. So anything that was pre-recorded, we could have that captioned and transcribed in advance. And actually, when I say captioned and transcribed, 
if you use a service that does captioning, you can also get a transcript. So it's kind of the same process. You do this one process and you get two outputs, a caption file that puts the captions at the bottom of your video and a transcript, which is just the text of the thing. So for the big live primetime events, we did what GA has always done and pay somebody to do it. And they're on, they're either on a, well, in the past they've been on a phone line. In this case, I think they were in the Zoom meeting. Um, and there were so actually somebody capturing the event and the, the, what they were typing would show up at the bottom of the screen as, as live captions. And the only problem we had there was that one or two of the general sessions went way, way over, like 45 minutes or an hour over. And we'd scheduled these captions and they were human beings with lives and they could stay like 15 minutes late, but I would start, they would text me on their phone saying, I, I have to go, I can't, I can't keep doing this. I, you know, they try to get somebody to sub in for them. And in some cases they just had to leave. So what was cool is that we had this other system called otter.ai and in your browser, you can go to otter.ai and see what it is. And actually they have free accounts, which you might want to play with. Um, and they will take either just the sound in the room or the, there's a plug-in for Zoom, the, the sound from Zoom and transcribe it. It's, it's you know, machine transcription, so it's not perfect. And it doesn't come up at the bottom of the screen as captions. It comes up in a separate browser window. So that's a little more confusing for people. There are a lot of people that the idea of having two windows open at the same time is not familiar to them. Um, but it did a pretty amazing job. So all of the workshops had this otter.ai plugin working. And so there was a link right in the Zoom meeting. Um, and you could click that and then this live transcription thing would show up right in the, right in another browser window. And uh, it kind of looked like this. And you know, it's not, you can see it's not perfect. It's totally, comprehensible right you know it's not a tech coast it's a tech host but you would know what they meant it was pretty good and the cool thing is then we could save these all afterwards so for almost every single event we have not only captions on the video but we also have a transcript um, which is really fantastic because transcripts are great not only for folks that have hearing impairment but also I hate watching videos. I would much rather read. And even if I'm going to watch the video, if I can like scan the transcript beforehand to say, oh, no, actually, this is boring. I don't want to watch. Oh, no, this is good. I do want to watch it, but I'm going to skip the first 10 minutes. Um, I really like that a lot. And also, um, if you have a page with a video on it and you have the transcript on the same page, Google will index all the words in the transcript. So it makes that video findable. So if you're saying, man, I know there's a really interesting video and it was last year's GA and it was something about indigenous people and water rights, you could search for that. And Google can't search the sound of the video, but it can search the text of the transcript on the page. So anyway, really excited about the increased accessibility that we were able to do. And, um, and for your congregations, you could actually look into using otter.ai if you have people who um, are interested in having um, transcripts happen. The free account might not work. It's limited to 600 minutes a month. And I think each event is limited to 40 minutes. Um, but the, I don't think the accounts are very expensive. So you might want to look into that. So that's what we did. And we had almost 5,000 registrants, which makes it the third largest GA in history. So that was cool. And we did about 47 workshops live and 21 pre-recorded. And everything's still available on demand. In fact, we've had people register for GA after GA is over because there's so much good stuff that they want to watch. Um, now there is some stuff that is available on, uh, on UUA.org. And we're going to be moving more things to UUA.org when, 
uh, probably in September. And let me actually share this because I want to give the link to Jennifer also. So if you go to UUA.org, you, you won't see that black stuff at the top because I'm logged in. Um, you can go to virtual participation. And there's a list of all the stuff that you could see if you are not, um, if you're not a, GA, a registered GA attendee, this is all stuff you could see for free. So here's the Sunday morning worship. And Herb was asking about the music. Um, there was, there's always a GA choir and I never get to sing in it because it always rehearses during GA and I'm always running around like a chicken with my head cut off. But this year I could sing in it because you had to record your parts about two weeks in advance. And we did two pieces, We Are by Usain Barnwell and a new piece called Tomorrow um, by Kate and Justin Minor. And they're both really amazing pieces. Um, and so we post, in addition to having them part of the Sunday morning worship over in the right hand sidebar here, we posted the videos also separately. And the way that was done is a musician named Benji Messer um, created videos for each of the parts to sing along with. And so we had to record ourselves with headphones or whatever on so we could listen to his video and then record just us. And each video started with Benji explaining how it worked. And then he said, okay, now you're gonna clap with me four times. Here we go. One, two, three, four. And then he'd say, okay, now we're gonna sing. And then you'd hear, uh, it was a recording. And then with somebody singing our part louder to make it easier to sing along. So I think that those claps are because that way on the, when you look at the audio track, you'll see that blip, 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 and it'll make it easy to line up the audio. Um, so then somebody did an amazing job of gluing. I, I mean, I think what they do then is to separate the audio from the video. They take all those audio tracks, synchronize them, and, um, and at that point, I don't know if they glom each part, like combine each part together, because they've got a, a balance. They probably had twice as many altos as they had tenors, right? Because that's what life is. Yep. And um, so, you know, they might have taken the altos down and boosted the tenors. Anyway, they did an incredible job. And then they took all these videos of people and turned them into the tiny little thumbnail so you get the whole effect. And the cool thing about we are, is it part of the words to we are, we are our grandmother's dreams, we are our grandfather's, I forget what. And they asked for um, us to submit family pictures, especially family pictures of our grandparents. And so rather than just having it be us singing the whole time, it, they start showing these wonderful pictures. So anyway, um, watch the worship and watch those videos because they were cool. So, uh, so you had uh, just the accompaniment in your in your ears, not a click track itself. Not a well, I don't know exactly what a click track is, but click it was, track is, usually is tick tick, tick tick so that you can hear know exactly when the beat is. No, well, this because you're singing along with the recording, mm -hmm. that it gives you the beat. Okay, so you're singing along with your own part. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And actually, good. we're singing along with all eight parts. Because in some of these cases, just our own part would have made no sense at all. Okay, and, okay. And it's hard when you have like 17 measures of rest and then you have to know when to come in. Yep, yep. Much easier if you can be hearing everybody else. Um, yeah, we, uh, we, we uh, our choir did one piece together. It wasn't, wasn't as good. Um, we, did, we did figure out the clapping business that really makes it possible to synchronize. Yeah. I was the bass section and the only male in the tenor section. <laughs> there we go. Well, I did one for my congregation, which was pretty lame. I, I don't know if it's online anywhere, I'd have to look. So I recorded myself, it was Blessed by Louis Collins. I don't know if anybody knows it. 
So I recorded myself singing the soprano. Well, first I got the sheet music and permission from Louis Collins. And the sheet music was in C. So then I went on YouTube and found a recording of her singing it so we could all be listening in our ears to Louis Collins singing it and we could sing along. Great. The only problem is it was in C sharp. What the hell? So, um, so I realized that um, using Audacity, which is a free audio editing. I use it all the time. Yeah, I shifted it down as half a step. So now we have it in C. So, because for singers, it doesn't matter because none of us have perfect pitch. But we had one person playing, our housemate actually playing the cello. And that would have driven them insane to have to move everything up a half pitch. So I recorded myself singing the soprano, myself singing the alto, myself singing the tenor, myself singing the bass and octave up. Ollie, our housemate, recorded himself singing, uh, I mean, playing the cello. And then two friends of ours recorded themselves together doing the soprano and alto. And then one of them recorded himself playing the piano. So then I took that and mixed it together. But I didn't know how to do all the little thumbnails of all the individual people. I just, I, I think maybe now I know how to do it, but I didn't know how to do it at that point. So it is a lot of work, though. It is a lot of work. The one who did it uh, for, for us actually used GarageBand to do it. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Well, I know that the deadline for all of the material to be shown in GA was the Wednesday before. And I'd say fully 5% of the material was submitted by the deadline. And at the very last thing to come in were these two pieces, We Are and Tomorrow. And they came in Saturday afternoon to be shown Sunday morning, which meant that we had Saturday afternoon to splice them in where they went into the video and then get the captions done. Because you can get all the words transcribed, but the timing is not going to be right if you insert stuff in the middle. So that was a little crazy making. But I think it just took them way longer than they thought. Oh, and apparently for We Are, um, Issei Barnwell actually sings the solo, which is fantastic and she's incredible, but she's a little older now than she used to be. <laughs> and they had to take the whole thing down a third <laughs> so that she could sing the soprano. So anyway, that's, that's what happened. Very interesting. Yeah. So can we, um, uh, segue a little bit from music to a vid, uh, the visual component. Hang on. So um, this isn't the first time I've thought, uh, you know, when you're talking about a banner parade, I know this was very last, you're trying to figure it out, but um, I thought, I keep thinking, I hear this, you know, we can't do this, we can't do this. Um, it's, it would be cool for everyone to like, like just sing, you just send a picture of their, their banner. So, and to do a banner parade where, you know, each one gets its own moment in the sun and then gets put into a, a bigger picture that maybe, you know, if you pan back, it becomes the UUA logo or it becomes the, the, um, the program, I don't know, whatever illustration is designed for something like that. This is, um, this is what they did for the banner parade. I actually have never seen this and we probably don't want to show the whole thing, but it's it's a montage of banner parades past. Yeah. This might be loud, I'm not sure. Greetings, friends. You know, the times may be challenging. The work may be hard. But we have each other. And we're ready to go. pauses because I don't want to do the whole thing. One thing that you do notice is the video quality goes from completely terrible in 2005 and slowly gets better and better as we get closer to the present. Yeah. So I figured that, that was, this was the way to do something like a bear parade. Yeah, that's cool. Um, 
so my, you know, my suggestion would go to, um, you know, if I'm standing there watching the parade go by, I can get a really good look at those banners because they're beautiful and people busted their butts to make them. And so that's, you know, I don't know if there's some other forum besides a banner parade, you know, where they can actually show off those beautiful works of art and a time where people can really take a look. Was yeah. that, is that, I mean, that's just a suggestion of mine. I don't know, because I'm sure a lot of people have thought about it. Well, you know, we have a way to do that. And I should actually propose that again, because now we have a new person in charge of the GA office. So there's a thing on UUA.org where you can log in and you can post something that your congregation did. Like yeah. if you go to the Black Lives Matter section, you can log in and you can post, here's a picture of our congregation's Black Lives Matter. We could make one of those for congregation's banners and just say post your image of your banner and then that would be a way of us collecting them and then we could put them all up somewhere i think it'd be really awesome yeah i'm not that. gonna know to that i think that'd be cool because it would be it'd be easy for us to do because we already have that mechanism of people posting what we call shares where you share something your congregation did we've already got it you guys already have the banners um Well, but those would be useful. Any other questions about GA? So when, so, um, oh, go ahead, Matt. So uh, from an authentication standpoint, you know, and you went from in person to uh, online and, um, and, you know, people had to, you, you guys had to change their, their registration fees and, and all that. Was the Larry page, was that the uh, way that you knew that a person coming in had paid and was supposed to be there? What, so it, it's clever the way he did this. Um, Cause we've had this participation portal going for a while. And it, over the last five years, Larry figured out that asking people to remember a password turns out to be hopeless. Forget it, not gonna happen. Especially if you give them the password in March and then they're not gonna need it until late June. Or to say, well, use the same password that you used last year, totally not gonna happen because there's no way they're gonna know it. So, um, so instead, you go to gaonline.uua.org, you put in your email address and it sends you a link that has a password embedded. You click that link, you come in and you're logged in. So, um, and the, the database that this is running against is coming out of the GA registration database, which is a commercial uh, conference database. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, and so did that pre prevent Zoom bombing, essentially? Well, theoretically, we, we had it set so that you had to be registered to join a Zoom meeting. Every Zoom meeting had a waiting room, no passwords, but waiting rooms. And we never published the meeting IDs of the Zoom meetings at all. I mean, the primetime events would never get published anyway, because only the board and the moderators and the speakers were in those. But the workshops where a bunch of us were in, um, those were never ever published. So you would go directly from that participants portal and you'd click, I wanna go into this workshop and it just took you into Zoom, registered you automatically and took you into the, into the Zoom meetings. You know that sort of a lot of Zoom bombers get Zoom IDs from databases of Zoom meetings that are created by spiders that run around the web and look for links to Zoom meetings. We didn't have any links, links to Zoom meetings. So Zoom bombers that were gonna get in that way we were invisible to them. Um, uh, yeah, and then the waiting room was our second line of defense. And then our third line of defense. Did you have a lot of trouble with older people? Sorry, did you have a lot of trouble with older people um, and the technology interface? Yes, that brings me to yet another group of volunteers. I didn't even talk about the group of volunteers that cleaned up the captions and edited the videos. We won't, we won't talk about them. That brings us up to 50 some. Then there was a group of volunteers who were doing tech support and they, if anybody was having trouble with anything could write to GA online support at UUA.org and 
ask for help. And actually a whole lot of people never figured that out and they just wrote to info at uua.org or web at uua.org. So emails were coming in all over the place. We had a ticketing system where those emails would go into a database and you could see a list of the requests. And then we had, I think, seven volunteers and two or three staffers who were just answering those questions. And then there was an additional group of about six people who normally are doing hospitality when it's on site, they're doing hospitality, but they're, what's hospitality in this case? So we said, no problem, we'll take your group and we're gonna give you the people who are just, just confused, they're just sunk. Like they asked a question, we answered them and they're still nowhere. And so these are the people that really need a phone call and really need to have somebody talk them through it. Talk them through it, yeah. Yeah, exactly, so there was this sort of additional they weren't called hospitality, I thought that they were called um, people that the people handling the regular tickets, if they realize this is, this, is, this person is not going to be able to get it just by us emailing them instructions, it's not going to be enough. And we had extra folks to do that. We also had um, a right relations team, which we always have if people feel like they're not being treated right. And we had chaplains if people felt like things were distressing. So they, they were also people that were getting emails about stuff. You could really segue into a coffee hour, but. Oh yeah, I was thinking, I mean, if, uh, if Matt wanted to open up breakout rooms, we could have a you know, continued Q&A right. about, uh, about GA, and then we could have a general social hour. And since with the number of people we have, that seems like the right breakdown of things. That was amazing, Maria. I mean, I've heard you, I watched you do this, and I've heard you talk about this in you know dribs and drabs, but just to hear you do the whole thing from soup to nuts was pretty amazing. Have you, um, <laughs> so another money-making idea. Um, have gone to conferences that had 8,000 people there and um, you know even running this stuff in person you really need a strong tech support and you need the you need the organization in place and I can tell you at least for um, comparative biologists they still don't get it because <laughs> this was you know they um, just the internet connection sucked a lot of the times, just trying to get sorted out so you could get in the right spot. On the web sucked a lot of the times. And, you know, a lot of us are okay with computers. Yeah. So it was more about the organizational stuff, I thought. Is there ever any, do you ever get any um, requests from other organizations? Is that something that you would do to... Larry and Latani Richardson, who is the head of the GA office, are going to go on the road with this. Yeah. One of our volunteers is a UU, but she works for, it's the ECA, is that maybe the Evangelical Council of America, something like that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, she said, oh my God, we need to find out how you did this. And there was a, there's a, I don't know if it's the religious communicators, there, there are religions, denominations get together and share information about how to do all this stuff. That's how Deb Weiner back in 1993 found out about the web and called me and John and said, we need to do this web thing. Yeah. And so um, I think Larry and Latanya are going to be taught, I mean, virtual on the road, obviously, but saying, all right, here's how we did it to, uh, to a bunch of different denominations because it really worked pretty well. I heard from some ministers because they had, UU ministers, they had the Ministers Association right before GA that it was really confusing and not as put together. I'm sure they have a much smaller budget. And this really was pretty put together. The idea of having that single portal so you always knew where to go, with this menu down the side, you could see the schedule, you could click, you could see here's what's on right now. Whatever's on in the main hall was always in the main hall. Um, it, people did not, I think, get lost that much. Which was that's that's amazing. spectacular yeah. for that that number of people. That's spectacular. Yeah, you yeah. know, because it it technically shouldn't be that hard, <laughs> but you know, there it is. Just getting everybody onto Zoom. I mean, I thought with my congregation, I thought no, no, we have to stream this to YouTube because trying to get everybody onto Zoom is going to be a nightmare.